What is up, guys, and welcome. I am Roby Tech here at Newegg, hanging out with, I got to say, probably one of the smartest people I've gotten to know in just a short period of time. Guys, I'm here with JJ from Asus, and today we are talking about everything you want to know about 12th Gen Intel as well as Z690. Anyway, JJ, let's kick it off. What is 12th Gen and why should we care? Fantastic, man. Thanks for having me here. Um, thanks to everybody that's checking us out here on Newegg. To your point as far as what makes 12th Gen interesting or exciting, it's just Intel kind of really reimagining what performance can look like when it comes to a desktop class CPU and trying to not only hit, I think, the current kind of performance targets that we need for you know games, for general desktop productivity, for content creation, but also looking towards the future and different types of workloads that maybe are only starting to kind of find their way into the desktop use while also fulfilling, of course, more specialized needs. And that's really what you see here with the introduction of this new microarchitecture and also a, a new approach to what Intel is doing as far as the quote unquote, you know, cores that are inside of your CPU, which we now have two new cores. We've got a P core and we have an E core. And traditionally in the past, when we were talking about cores, you know, we might've talked about frequency. We might've talked about the number of cores and threads relatively, but we kind of saw it as a whole, okay, once we knew kind of general kind of architecture information, that was it. But here, there's a lot more baked into the actual process because um, it's really been redesigned from the ground up to be able to offer a focus on really, really high performing single thread performance, which is what those P cores are going to be focused for. And then also really robust kind of background and multi-threaded application performance, but still very good single threaded performance on those E cores. I see this as kind of a really great hybrid experience. We're really getting a lot of the amazing stuff that was really great uh, within kind of the, the tried and true Intel architecture in the past, but we're getting this entirely new, uh, you know, uh, platform to be able to work with. And some people wonder what's well, like, you've got this E core and you've got this P core. Well, how are you gonna know how the system is gonna be able to kind of tune your workload per each one of these uh, types of cores. And that's where Intel did something with the Thread Director where they implemented this technology to look low level and be able to essentially assign um, you know, the correct workload. So you know, if you're opening up a game or you're opening up Premiere, it's gonna go to the P course, right? But if you're having maybe like email sync in the background, that's gonna be handled by the, by the E course. Um, this is really important because from an enthusiast perspective, sometimes the way that we evaluate a system in the real world is just how we use it. And they can even offset stuff. Right? It could go from all of a sudden having something that was running on the P core and then shift it over to the E core, do this all very much dynamically. So I myself have been really impressed and I think um, this is laying a great foundation for right now for users that want to adopt it, but definitely for the future. You know, there's actually been additional work that um, Intel has done along with Microsoft where there's actually a new API that um, software developers can use to be able to better balance actually how applications will be able to be shifted between the two different cores. Edge is already going to take advantage of this. The priority is that it focuses on the E core. Uh, it doesn't actually use the P core. And, and keep in mind that if we talk already about IPC performance, the E core has already been tuned to be able to offer a much greater uplift compared to kind of Skylake, which was foundationally um, an architecture and a performance that a lot of people are already aware of. In the vast majority of the CPUs that have been out from Intel for the last couple of years, as far as kind of the baseline of what defines performance. That being noted, who knows? I, I think this is gonna be the interesting thing is that as we move forward, definitely over the next year, year plus, um, you know, we'll see developers begin to kind of take a look at this API um, and then be able to make their kind of uh, decisions as far as whether they want something to be kind of focused on that P core or they want it to be on the E core. But importantly, the thread director does manage a lot of this work um, in the background. And this helps to kind of offload a lot of the kind of software dependency in terms of having to have things be tuned. You know, you and I were talking a little bit before even we, we got on the show, we were talking about um, how much even 12th gen is basically unlocking a lot of potential for things for the future. I think when we take a look at kind of the platform overall, we always want to keep in mind that of course the CPU now carries a lot of kind of technology that's baked in. And so one is going to be the memory controller, and then the other one is going to be your PCIe lanes, uh, which are commonly most associated with generally either your storage or your graphics devices. And here we have massive, uh, you know, real step what we call step change and improvements, right? We're gonna move over from DDR4, which has been around for now quite some time, and we're moving to DDR5. And really what we're gonna get with DDR5 is going to be just improvement across the board, right? We're going to larger densities, we're going to more bandwidth, we're going to more efficient and effective operation. We do wanna note though that um, you don't have to necessarily have to adopt into DDR5. Um, the 12th gen based platforms um, in terms of a motherboard design and of course on the CPU support side will support both, 
uh, DDR4 and DDR5. But you know, if we're talking about kind of the best case scenario, if you want the absolute best performance, you're going to want to transition over to DDR5. When we're talking about performance, uh, you talk about things like IPC lift, stuff like that. For people who may not know some of the jargon, what does that mean? That's a great question. Uh, pretty much just the short way to think about it is instructions per cycle. Sometimes people will say instructions per clock. They're both pretty much accurate. And at the end of the day, all this just essentially means is how responsive uh, the, the CPU is to essentially running certain things that are being fed into the CPU. This is getting a lot more complicated though with applications um, as we move into not only where we are right now, but we also move into the future because you can have things that are optimized and coded for different types of instructions. So um, this can mean that you know your processor can uh, have very, very high performance for maybe certain types of workloads, and then it can have exponentially higher performance for other types of workloads. But that's pretty much what we're talking about is IPC just essentially means is how fast the CPU is attempting to process whatever workload is, is being sent to it. I think you actually brought up a, something really interesting there. You talked about taking a look at a lot of different benchmarks to get an idea of like how good a CPU is. I'd love to get some insight into your brain, which I mean, honestly is scaringly massive. If we were gonna do like the JJ benchmark, what would that look like? It's challenging because it can be difficult for users to sometimes figure out, is this the right CPU for me? Um, you know, really what I tell most users is, what are the top five things that you do? These are the things that unquestionably you're gonna do consistently. And then from there, try to find corresponding information. The reason why I point something out like this is that even if we take a look at, let's say like Rocket, like even compared to let's say, other options that are in the marketplace, like uh, you know AMD's um, very high performance, you know Ryzen-based 5000 series parts, um, you could actually let's say go into AutoCAD, and AutoCAD actually showed a significant uplift even compared to the best performing Ryzen 5000 series parts. Another scenario could be things like ultra high refresh rate gaming. Um, us as like me, my general gaming primary system, I've got a 1440p and then I also have a 4K. I don't really focus on ultra high refresh rate, but take for instance, we've got, you know, 240, 280, 360 hertz monitors, and we're on our journey to a thousand hertz. Um, what we found is that definitely, you know, high frequency along with actually high speed DDR memory can direct, directly influence performance in ultra high refresh rate 1080p gaming scenarios. So you kind of have to really break it down to what's the resolution and what's the gameplay experience that I'm looking for. Um, if you're on that creation side, you could have very, very different experiences. Are you doing denoising? Um, are you doing, you know, special types of, um, you know, mosaic or stitch composition? Are you doing heavy batch conversion? That's going to also have a performance aspect to it. This is where it can be tricky. So you kind of have to try to really figure out, you know, um, what are you going to look for? And then try to see if you can find, you know, uh, spaces, right? Whether they're individuals like yourself, which really do a lot of real world nice examples of, you know, what users are seeing, whether they're gaming or whether they're in the creation, um, but also look in your respective communities and see what that feedback is from users on what their actual experience is. Let's talk about how should somebody go about picking a motherboard for the first time? It's a great question, and it's one of the most challenging questions that exists out there for, I think, PC DIY builders, but one that we try to make easier, um, ultimately, by just trying to have a wide range of boards to be able to kind of hit different price points and different types of use cases. Um, so from, you know, Asus' perspective for Z690, um, we're going to have multiple series. We'll have five total series, so we've got the Prime series. We'll have the Tough Gaming series, the ROG Strix series, the ROG Maximus series, and we'll also have the Pro Art series. And, and pretty much what we just mean by having these different series is outside of the aesthetic aspect of each one of these boards is that we've tried to tailor different boards to different types of users. From a performance perspective, you can feel confident that across the board, pretty much all the boards are going to be the same level of performance. So what I mean by that is you shouldn't necessarily buy the motherboard based off your perspective that I'm going to get lower performance for my you know, i7 or i9 because I'm picking a quote unquote more entry board. That's not our design intent. Our design intent was to really try to make sure that the performance experience is consistent across all of these. Where the differential will come in is maybe how many USB ports you need. That's where it comes down to kind of understanding what do you need? And that is gonna be tied into a lot of other pieces, right? So that's usually what I try to ask people is like, you know, what's your primary work focus or your, your primary game focus or your primary kind of workflow? Um, and then that will help you to kind of start to guide in towards which series might make more sense for you. And then form factor. Form factor, of course, is also another key part that you always want to keep in mind. Um, we will offer all form factors for this generation. We'll have many ITX, micro ATX, and ATX, but 
the vast majority of the market does build with an, an ATX based metal board. JJ, come on, no, that can't be true. So if I get a Hero Maximus board, I, I guarantee overclocks at seven gigahertz. Come on, that's true, right? <laughs> yes, and totally not. <laughs> uh, what we do try to ensure is if you scale up and you go to a higher end um, board, um, we do definitely look at um, more premium design elements. If we compare, let's say, our Prime board to, let's say, our Maximus board, they both have very good quality audio designs, but one has an integrated DAC and a specialized amp that's built onto it. So maybe if you've got nicer headphones, right? Maybe you spent a couple hundred dollars and you've got better headphones and you'll appreciate better audio, then it would maybe make more sense to invest in a board like the Maximus as opposed to the standard Dash A. It doesn't actually matter the quality of the isolated audio design on the motherboard because you're bypassing it. You're using a digital uh, connection. You're using that USB and that has its own internal DAC and amp that's built into it. In that regard, we, we really have tried to design the boards to be in alignment with um, you know, a set of features and functions and specifications that complement certain types of users and certain types of builds. Why don't we do it this way? So let's go through some user scenarios. I'm a content creator. Uh, basically, I'm a streamer, a Twitch streamer. I play a variety of games, and every once in a while, I edit videos that go to YouTube. You know, I'm not necessarily budget conscious, but I don't want to spend a minute. What, what should I look at from that from that perspective? That would already be a, actually a pretty, I'd say more specialized type of user because while that does get thrown a lot in the gaming industry, there's not really that many people that really fall into all three of those at one time. Um, but if you were somebody that did kind of do all of that, I think the ROG would be a really great choice. And I also still think the Pro Art series would also be a really great choice. Even our Prime series would make the great choice. That, you know, in our polling, we've seen a lot of users feedback to us that aesthetics drive their immediate kind of buy into something. When you take a look at our boards, if you take a look at the Prime series, they feature a really distinct white design silhouette. Really nice white accents that are actually inspired by space and a lot of kind of space motif designs. And then they've got this really nice clean black PCB. Those are gonna be a distinct kind of brighter type of theme type of build choice that you want. If you wanna go with something more in that classic kind of black monochrome vibe, then a lot of other boards fill up that spacing. So that's also another way that you can kind of take a look at it. But, you know, to your point, um, I think probably, you know, for that segment, I would be taking a look at ROG series, whether ROG Strix, ROG Maximus, or our Pro Art series. Um, any one of those could fit, could fit that mold. Okay, I'm an audio engineer. Uh, basically, pretty much strictly doing with audio, don't really dabble much in anything like that, but for the most part, like I care about dealing with you know high quality audio files. Where would I probably look at from your guy from your perspective on something like that? I think for those users, the Prime series and also the Pro Art series would be a really good baseline, uh, especially because a lot of audio engineers and things like that, they're probably going to use external DAWs, right? They're going to have their own uh, DACs. You probably don't necessarily need a focus to maybe get the board that has the integrated DAC on it because you've got outboard solutions. Many of our motherboards all will feature uh, what we call a Thunderbolt header um, and allow you to install the Thunderbolt 4 adding card. So you could get like, let's say, our Z690-A board and then optionally install that Thunderbolt 4 adding card. So maybe I'm just gonna run the integrated iGPU, and then from there I even want more supplemental storage. So again, I don't necessarily need to jump to an overclocking board that has overclocking functions on it. Um, I could get a Prime Series and then maybe add in our Hyper M.2 adding card um, that would give me up to four additional M.2 SSDs. I think Prime Series, uh, Pro Art Series would be really well tuned for kind of that uh, production type of flow. And I think that's the thing is like, I think one of the things is like in, in all of these cases, there are usually a variety of your boards that can cover many of those scenarios. Oh, that, don't knock that over. That, then just people just start crying when you're like just dropping. Them. There's more than one choice. And a lot of that is like coming down to all in all that you guys give variety. Maybe the one that is like the easiest is like, hey, I'm a hardcore extreme overclocker. I'm gonna definitely custom loop my build. Do I only have one choice in that case or do I have multiple choices there too? So I'd say for the, the higher end enthusiast, right? Somebody that really cares about tweaking and tuning, overclocking, right? Um, is into a custom water cooling. We would unquestionably tell you that the ROG Maximus series, right? We've got boards that'll be purpose built in with advanced water cooling connectivity, the best overclocking features and functions in the industry, including our AIOC technology. We've got solutions like that. We also then have even more specialized boards like the Apex series, which is gonna be purpose built for those that are really kind of demanding the absolute top end for overclocking capability. And we really will get into the minutia with um, you know, all the specialized options and hardware functions that we've introduced there. But 
you could still buy, you know, a RG Strix board, you could get that Dash 8 board, you could get a tough gaming board. And the power delivery, the heat sink design, all the things there are still going to give you a great OC experience. Where the ROG boards will, let's say, maybe be better even for those enthusiasts is it'll make it even simpler with things like our AIOC technology or, like I said, maybe uh, friendlier to your custom water cooling loop because of what we're integrating on the, the specialized headers or the more kind of specialized connection options, right? Um, but you know, uh, even still, I think for that overclocking segment, you can really still feel confident that just about any one of the boards in the lineup are going to give you a great experience uh, from that Dash A all the way up to our Extreme or our Glacial model, which will be our, our flagship models. Okay, JJ, you, you got me sold. I like, do I have to replace all my hardware? No, uh, you will be entirely okay. So the great thing that we've done for this generation is that our boards essentially have um, mounting holes in them that will allow you to have cross compatibility with the current kind of socket 1200 coolers that are commonly on the market. So here you can see this is actually our RG Strix LC2 cooler. Um, and we've actually already made an announcement, all of our essentially refresh coolers. So the Strix LC2, the Tough Gaming LC, um, the Ryogen 2, all of those models will ship with 1700 uh, brackets, right? That essentially you can do that. But if you've got an older cooler, the holes are there. So you can essentially still take your existing, existing cooler, mount it on there and get up and running. Um, that cross compatibility is a really nice thing that you might not think about, but the great thing is you don't even have to think about it. If you just get one of our boards, they're already gonna have those mounting holes and you'll be good to go. This may seem like, you know, a no brainer, but that also means if you're doing CPU blocks, like you're, you water block the 9900K, you're also good to go with one of your boards as well, right? That's correct, yep. As always, like I said, you may see that manufacturers might maybe produce a newer version that might be purpose designed that even offer better performance, but you can totally take your pre-existing solution, mount it in there and get up and running. From a board perspective, we try to be kind of harmonious and kind of holistic in terms of how we approach motherboard design. So unquestionably, you know, being the largest motherboard manufacturer in the world, um, you know, we our focus is to be able to offer a stable and reliable platform that you can feel confident in, right? Coming up in part two. It won't be on every single board, is this little button that's right here. When you depress that, it actually will unlock and allow you to remove the card. So we got our white tee. We got our, we, we, okay, we're ready. Let's, what are we doing? <laughs> yes, I am ready. I'm ready to overclock. 